Hello, thanks for joining us here for Middle East Matters. I'm Julia Kim, coming up on our program this week. Families of the victims killed in Iraq's protests claim the government is falsifying death certificates. Our correspondent on the ground sent us a special report. Also coming up in the show, the pen is mightier than the sword for these cartoonists in Lebanon, where the country's political and economic woes are fueling political satire. And as the UN's Agency for Palestinian Refugees marks its 70th anniversary, France 24's Adèle Gastel illustrates why it's facing its worst crisis to date. But first, to Iraq, where deadly anti-government demonstrations continue to rock the country. Since protests broke out in October, over 400 people, mostly young, unarmed protesters, have been killed by Iraqi forces. Officials say that only 111 people have died. Meanwhile, the families of protesters killed in the unrest are accusing the government of falsifying their death certificates. They say that officials change the cause of death of their loved ones and are contesting the documents. Our correspondent in Baghdad, Ibrahim Saleh, went to meet with some of the families. Sheb Ahmed Aziz is one of the victims of Iraq's protest movement. He died on November 10th after being shot by riot police on Al Habubi Square in the city of Nasiriyah. But a few days later, Ahmed's family was shocked when they saw that the cause of death on official government paperwork was different from what they'd gotten from the hospital. The paper we got from the hospital said he died from a gunshot wound, while the official death certificate mentions what they call a laboratory death. We've taken legal action to ask the judiciary and the Ministry of Health to hold accountable those who waste the blood of our martyrs. In Baghdad and other southern provinces, there are many cases of death certificates being changed by the government. There are even alleged cases of demonstrators being kidnapped and killed. Authorities claim those deaths are the results of criminal activity, but families and friends of victims blame the government and militias. These incidents have angered protesters even further who blame Iraq's leaders and the entire political class. We want to meet with a committee so we can give them the name of our martyrs, but we refuse to negotiate with the government. We have given our blood. Talking to them would be humiliating. We want to overthrow the government and to hold the corrupt accountable because nobody will bring back those who died. According to a recent report published by the Iraqi Commission for Human Rights, at least 420 demonstrators have been killed since the start of the protest movement on October 1st. But this figure isn't acknowledged by Iraq's Ministry of Health. They say no more than 111 people have died in the unrest. Well, turning now to Lebanon and its international allies are coming together to urge the country to find a way out of its economic and political quagmire. Ongoing mass protests against the ruling elite prompted the resignation of Prime Minister Saad Hariri. But six weeks later, Lebanon is still locked in a political impasse. Meanwhile, the country is grappling with its worst economic crisis since the 1975 civil war. Well, the situation is at least fueling the creativity of the country's artists. Showing that a picture is indeed worth a thousand words, young illustrators are making their opinions known through political cartoons. Monty Francis and Noemi Roche reports. December 1st in Beirut, the Lebanese people demonstrate against their government. It may be not obvious at first, but Mohammed came to protest as well. Armed with pen and paper, his drawings are his form of expression. With this drawing, I wanted to show how all of Lebanon has become a public space. We're done with the taboo of, oh, this is a private space, we cannot enter it. The streets are now the property of the people, of all of us. At 24, Mohammed has a master's degree in press illustration. A few months ago, he published some of his drawings online with a very political message. Now those drawings have a new resonance since the protest movement began. We young people are facing a generation of older people with a heavy past who want to control us. We need young people to run this country. 
Bernard Hodge is also hoping for political change. The 31-year-old cartoonist portrays the life of his country with humor under the pseudonym The Art of Boo. Appearing in the newspaper L'Orient Le Jour, he marked the first month of protests, imagining what he hopes Lebanon will be like in 10 years. It's a message hidden in nuance because he recognizes he can't say everything he might want to. Yes, we are a democratic state, but I know my limits. We've heard many stories of people imprisoned for something posted on Facebook. I try in my work to criticize those I want to criticize, but I turn around the subject instead of talking about it directly. To shine a light on the problems, that's how Bernard sees his role in what he hopes will be a revolution. And just as the characters in this cartoon, if the movement fails, he plans to leave the country. Well, the uncle of Syrian leader Bashar al-Assad is being tried in a French court this week. Rifat al-Assad is accused of aggravated tax fraud and misappropriation of Syrian funds. He owns nearly 100 million euros worth of properties in France, and investigators suspect that money may have been taken from Syrian state coffers. Shirley Sitbon has the details. Two townhouses and some 40 apartments in Paris a chateau and a horse farm. Rifat al-Assad owns 90 million euros worth of properties in France. Investigators and NGOs suspect Bashar al-Assad's uncle paid for those homes with money taken from Syrian state coffers. What we suspect is that these assets, estimated to be worth dozens of millions of euros, could have been illegally obtained. They don't match the salaries he received when holding various positions, like when he was Syria's vice president. Rifat al-Assad used to be a pillar of the regime, a military commander critics referred to as Hamas butcher for allegedly ordering a 1982 crackdown on protests. But after mounting a failed coup against his brother, he fled the country, settled in Europe and started investing in a set of properties via offshore companies. There is no Syrian public money behind this. Upon his arrival in Switzerland before reaching France, he received financial support from his friends. Rifat al-Assad says his fortune comes from a series of gifts from the Saudi royal family. But investigators say Riyadh has only transferred some 10 million euros. Assad's uncle is also being investigated in the UK and in Spain, where he owns more than 500 properties already seized by authorities. Well, this year, the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees marks its 70th anniversary. But UNRWA has little to celebrate. Since the U.S. stopped its contributions back in 2018, the U.N. agency is facing its worst financial crisis to date. As France 24's Adèle Gastel illustrates, the move has put at risk vital aid for hundreds of thousands of Palestinian refugees. With the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, Hundreds of thousands of Palestinians became refugees and started living in camps. The following year, the United Nations created an agency dedicated to Palestinian refugees and funded by the UN member states called UNRWA. Since then, UNRWA has been offering assistance and social services. With time, the number of refugees has increased. The agency has developed, created schools, hospitals, and even jobs. Today, UNRWA is active in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem, serving more than 5 million Palestinian refugees. In 2018, the United States, the biggest UN donor, suspended its funding for the agency and stopped all contributions. That decision came shortly after Donald Trump recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and transferred the U.S. Embassy there. In response, the Palestinian leadership froze all contacts with Washington. Seventy years after its creation, UNRWA is facing the worst financial crisis in its history. 
a crisis which affects millions of Palestinian refugees who rely on the agency's services. And finally, in Saudi Arabia, gender-segregated entrances in restaurants are no longer compulsory. Previously, all restaurants were required to have one entrance for women and families and another for men only. Sunday's announcement is another sign of sweeping reforms taking hold in the kingdom. For decades, strict social rules had forbidden unrelated men and women from mixing in public places. But over the past year, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman has eased restrictions. However, this societal shift has also been accompanied by a crackdown on dissent, including on the women who campaign for some of the new reforms. Well, that's it from us here on Middle East Matters. There's more news coming up. Stay tuned to France 24.